Welcome, everyone. Um, it's great to have you all here. I'm Pam Schaff. I'm the director of the HEAL program. And I want to um, introduce Ted Meyer in a minute, our artist in residence. Um, but I want to welcome Haven Lynn Kirk, who is the dean of the Roski School. She is um, an award-winning designer and um, accomplished artist in addition to her role as the dean of the medical at uh, the Roski School. But I want to thank her um, for her support in <clears throat> bringing the students at Roski and um, over to this, this adventure with our researchers here at Keck. And um, I wanted to say a few words. This, this whole um, idea, this is the fifth show, was Ted's idea. And, um, and I, I think I'm going to actually let you tell why it's important to you. But I am um, so grateful for the chance to see this beautiful work, to see the collaborations, the conversations that take place, and the ability to really I think on both the part of the researchers and the artists to understand the work that we all do in a new way and to make it understandable in a different way, a new way to um, the public and to patients and to all of us who, who do the work we do. So I think it's a brilliant idea. I'm glad you did it. And I'm gl grateful to see it again. So you want to mention HEAL, the people that don't know. Sure, um, HEAL, thank you. <laughs> HEAL is the Humanities, Ethics, Art, and Law Program. And um, this is a program that's been in existence at CAC since um, the 1980s. And our students study humanities, ethics, art, and law in addition to their um, core scientific um, endeavors in the medical school. We think that the, uh, the art and the science of medicine are two um, critical components. One doesn't take the place of another. We, they need, both need each other. And so our students do that as part of their um, required curriculum. And this is part of what we call our co-curriculum, so other opportunities for students in, to engage with art and humanities. Um, I want to recognize also my colleagues in that program, Dr. Erica Wright, who's the Associate Director of the HEAL program, and Paige Tonks, who is the Student Services Advisor for the Master's in Narrative Medicine program, and um, also works um, on behalf of the HEAL program, too. And uh, everything that we're partaking of today is because Paige made it happen. So thank you. Thank you both. I have my own microphone. So thank you all for being here. Thanks for doing work and letting us put it up. So uh, as Dr. Schaff was saying, the, the reason I like this show is because I have a very rare genetic illness. And when I was six years old, I gave bone marrow at NIH for a drug that I couldn't take until I was 42 years old. And I know that a lot of you researchers are stuck in your cubicles toiling away to save our lives, and no one ever sees you, nobody knows uh, what you're doing until you come up with these miraculous cures. So I wanted to know, let you all to know that I appreciate the work you do and get you guys out of your cubicle and give you a free sandwich. <laughs> so here we are. Um, what we would like to do is if any of the pairs are here, we, ha we have two researchers who aren't here, but one is, uh, his daughter is here and speak on his behalf, and two of the artists aren't, but we'd like you to talk about working as a team, so maybe uh, you guys can go to your paintings and Nigel will uh, videotape you talking about working as a team or about your work or whatever you'd like to say about your piece or collaboration. And again, thank you all for being here. It would be, thank you. Great if everyone can hear, you know, as each pair talks. Um, so if anyone would like to volunteer to go first, um, what we'll have you do is just stand by, by your um, collaboration and tell us all about it, and we'll do as many as want to do it. Hi everybody, my name is Claire Baldoff. Um, I'm a neonatologist um, at CHLA, which means um, I take care of little tiny humans. Um, I didn't prepare anything. I didn't know that I would have to, to talk. But um, so my research is, is focused on the placenta, um, which is the connector between a baby and a mom. Um, and my, what I'd like to do is collect the placenta after birth and um, save it and store it for research purposes. It's oftentimes just thrown in the trash. Um, so this is a beautiful painting. I'm so just excited to see it. I had never uh, seen it before this day, and I didn't know what exactly Sarvani was planning. Sarvani was amazing to work with. Um, she, I explained a pretty complicated subject to her, and she understood it right away. And I think that 
I think that this representation is beautiful, and I really hope that I'll be able to, to use it in some way um, in the creation of the bank to communicate with families, um, to encourage them to, to be part of the bank. So. When we come over here, we have a huge lab. Yes. We have everybody from the lab here. And, and video. Yeah. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Josh Neiman, and one of the faculty members in neurosurgery. Uh, I have a wet lab. Uh, I'm a card carrying neuroscientist, and my lab works with brain metastases of cancers that go up to the brain, like breast cancer, melanoma, and lung cancer. And we work on the interaction of how these tumor cells work with the brain, and how the brain allows these tumor cells to come up and colonize and grow, which is the demise of the patient. And so with that, you know, I had the privilege of working with things. I was par paired up with him, and he came into the lab. Again, told him a very hard concept, very, very hard concepts of the things we were doing in the lab, and he 100% understood it, uh, showed him tumor cells, brain cells, um, and he took this vision of, of one of the types of tumors that we study, breast cancer that goes to the brain, and a certain molecule or antenna that's on top of these tumor cells and how it interacts with the brain's environment. And he did an amazing visualization of this. So I'll let him explain it. I already know, but I just want him to. Because it's, it's, it's a 50-50 collaboration, right? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Is this one working? Hello. Hello, 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 hello. Okay. Yes, um, it was a great pleasure to work with um, Josh, and um, I really enjoyed the tour to the lab and really understand, not really understand, but trying to understand um, how um, um, certain cells work and the process to trying to um, understand how they behave and maybe one day we know um, the cause and stuff. So based on the information I got from um, Josh and um, and the assistant the postdoc and I instead of um, um, make a data visualization of the cells they got um, but I turned them into an island so so um, based on the model I simulated um, it went through a process of erosion and um, simulation to form this um, island and on top of the island, there are some uh, models. Um, is the um, specific protein called IL-13? Is that a right word? Um, so based on those information, how they distribute on top of the cells. So, but now it's an island, and um, so I'm really interested in the process of seeking how they behave and um, and how scientific process sometimes um, we. Um, have a look of different angles from the top and layers, but um, here is different angle of seems like we are sailing toward the island and um, it's always there and we're trying to um, understand it and and reach it um, and from far away um, maybe someday we will um, land on that island and um, understand how this um, um, cancer cells behave and their cost. All right, so Emily is going to, her researcher uh, couldn't be here today, but she will tell you all about her piece. Um, hello, uh, I'm Emily Eid. Um, I'm one of the students from Roski. Um, so my piece is talking about um, congenital heart disease in infants and how it affects um, their brain development and it can cause developmental delays. Um, so Tran, my researcher, uh, she essentially is working on studying this and studying the effects of congenital heart disease um, on their development. And she works with um, doing therapy with these infants and really helping them like get over this um, delay. So working with her was really fun and interesting. She's just a very like caring person. Um, just since she's working with babies and she's working with these families, you know, it's like a really stressful time to like be that doctor who has to help their child. 
Um, so I just thought it was a really cool experience to get to work with someone who does such um, important things every day. Um, and I wanted to do this because I actually have like a lot of chronic illness. Um, so I am here at Keck all the time, not for this, um, just for my treatments. So I thought that it would be good for like my work as an artist, which is about like my um, different conditions to get to work with a doctor on a different level um, and see like how she thinks about her work and translate that um, into art. So it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, I just wanted it to be like very kinetic and I wanted you to see that weight of the heart um, constricting the blood flow to the brain and causing that delay. And I use such like plush and kind of cute fabrics because they are babies. And you know, a lot of this project is about making art accessible to uh, our audience, which is pediatric um, care. So yeah, that's just my project. All right, uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Christian. I am actually currently an incoming senior undergraduate at USC studying human biology. Uh, I do research at the Morsut Lab here at the Keck School of Medicine, um, the Stem Cell and Regenerative Medicine Center. So in particular, my specific project and the work that I do uh, goes into the field of synthetic developmental biology. Uh, in particular, I have two main focus with my project. Uh, number one is, can we get cells to kind of, kind of organize and kind of create their own structures by communicating with each other through contact, adhesion signaling, proliferation, things of the sorts. So that's goal number one. Uh, goal number two with my project is that I actually started this project around the time of COVID. And, you know, remember COVID? I think those were great times for everyone. Um, during that time period, I was really just stuck with my computer a lot of times. I had really nothing else I could do. So I did a lot of computational work, actually, with my project. And so I was creating coding files, simulations, where I could create these kind of like elongated tissue structures um, using some data from in vitro work in the past and being able to kind of combine the two together. So eventually, I realized that in the technological computational aspect, I think there's a lot of practicalities with it. With the computational world, we can actually speed up a lot of the research work that we do, kind of like saving time, money, resources that we spend to do all these like, you know, crazy long in vitro, in vivo projects. So with that, that's kind of like the twofold of my project, just being able to understand how can we better understand cellular and tissue behavior, but also at the same time, can we create innovative techniques to actually speed up this process? Um, in particular, just want to say a few things about working with Elise. I think it was kind of amazing working with her. Um, I think what was really fascinating was that I think uh, working with Elise, kind of we paralleled a lot in many different ways. Um, first and foremost, uh, her work obviously dabbles in photography and Photoshop. Uh, for me, I actually enjoy photography myself, so I thought this could not have been any better of a fit. Um, in addition to that, uh, and I know Elise can speak on herself uh, later on as well too, but I know Elise started like going into Photoshop, photography around the same time, 2020. Uh, ironically, at the same time that I started research work at the same time. So kind of her process going through, you know, her artwork and me going through my own research journey. Obviously, it's only been two years. I have a long way to go. But kind of going through the process together, I think it was kind of really great to see how two people who just kind of started with the process very recently, kind of developing up to where it is right now, can lead to something like this. Uh, and yeah, I'll let Elise uh, and take it from here. Hi, my name is Elise. So working with Christian was absolutely fabulous. He was able to take something as insane as synthetic morphogenesis. Like, have you ever heard those words together? I don't think you have. He was able to take something so complex like that and able to break it down. And being able to learn about this incredibly micro, very small and molecular, I'm sorry, um, cellular research was so interesting. But I, as an artist, am very concerned about the core of things. So like, why are we the way that we are? Who are we because of our external forces? Things like that. And so being able to break his research down to its core and find out the core reasons of it was incredibly interesting. So synthetic, meaning imitation of a natural product, and morphogenesis, morphogenesis excuse me, meaning creation of shapes. And so stuff like shapes, and also just the idea of imitating a natural product was incredibly interesting to me as I dove into this process of recreating his research into this self-portrait. But his research was incredibly interesting to me because it walks a fine line of technology and reality. So he has these computational aspects like he was talking about. And in my work, I also have the computational aspect of working with Photoshop. Being able to manipulate things in computers and rely on the technology around us is so important to both of our works that it only seemed natural to do it this way. 
And then also he has this experimental part of his research where he works you know, in person to create something. And so having a human, having a self-portrait was another reason why we have ended up here. But thank you so much. I hope you guys enjoy. And his research is so interesting. So I please invite you to take the time to read about it and then take a little gander at this little guy. Thank you so much. You have your own PR person here. You, do you want to talk about your piece? It's OK. You can talk about it. We're, we're missing a researcher, but she will talk about it. So hello, I'm Katrina. I'm actually, I just finished my first year at USC. I'm studying health and human sciences and minoring in communication design. So I guess that's where my artistic side comes in. And um, my researcher, Dr. Jacob, um, isn't here right now, but basically his work revolves around the immune system. He's been studying the immune system for over 30 years. And in one of his papers um, that we discussed together and really highlighted was actually about COVID-19. And he basically talked about how um, there's, to the general public, there's usually this positive view on the immune system, right? We look at the immune system as this metaphor for like an army and then a, a defense system, right? They're like our key um, protector and they defend when um, antigens come and um, pathogens. But basically he, in his paper, he discussed how the immune, the immune system is actually um, a faulty system. You know, sometimes there's autoimmune diseases that occur, and then it can actually destroy itself. Some of the um, components, there are forces within the human body that can actually um, start attacking itself. So that's basically the core idea that we wanted to focus on in our piece. And we wanted to really include the, combine the scientific element with the artistic element through the actual 3D molecule, a 3D form of the MHC class two molecule, the T cell receptor and the antigen. So that together we identified basically like the holy trinity of the immune system was the, the MHC, two, MHC class two um, molecule, the T cell receptor and the antigen. So that is basically what you see here in the middle. And so this is the actual 3D structure of that holy trinity. And so um, this piece basically represents how the um, human organism is fragile, and when these three um, pieces interact, it can lead to a self-destructive process where the body starts breaking down. And so that is basically what we wanted to show in this piece. And through the stark contrast between the bright colors of the immune system and the darker colors of the human, we basically wanted to show how the immune system can produce two responses. There can be a positive response where it actually protects you or more of the negative response where it destroys itself. So yeah, so that is it. Thank you. Very nice. Thanks very much. I'm Alan Ager. I'm Director of Emergency and Transport Medicine at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. Um, when I got Ted's email about this program, I was somewhat confused. I thought he was saying, I'm looking for researchers who are also artists. And I thought, OK, well, I have a little bit of an artistic side. But I was pleasantly surprised that the real artist is Natalie Benchmuel. Um, and Natalie and I got to know each other over the last several months, and it's been really a very fulfilling experience. But as you can imagine, the Pediatric Emergency Department, um, see, we see about 90,000 patients, um, many of those medical illnesses, traumatic injuries of various types. Um, and I was explaining to Natalie that we see about 675 various conditions. Um, and so my research over the years has been eclectic, sort of like the patient population and conditions we see. So it started out, I did most of my research at the beginning of my career in pediatric dehydration. Uh, and that occurred for about eight to 10 years. And then I moved on to trauma and infection um, and ultimately now my research is primarily focused on mental health. Uh, mental health of patients, of families, of staff, uh, looking at the utility of debriefing, for instance. Um, and I brought Natalie in because I realized I live in a chaotic world that feels very comfortable for me because I've been doing it for so long. Um, but as I described it to Natalie over, over the months of our getting to know each other, 
I ultimately brought her in so she could also see kind of what the emergency department is all about and try to frame the environment to what I've done over the years as well as my research interests. So I'm, I'm very grateful. Um, I didn't see this art piece prior to coming in. Um, I think it was Natalie's goal to shock me. Um, I knew she was highly talented and very gifted. She's got warmth, a spirit, and really beauty. Um, and this piece I know speaks to her inner core and I know she'll be a phenomenal artist and I'm grateful that near the beginning of her career I could provide good subject matter for her. So I'm grateful, Natalie. Thank you very much. Testing. Here we get the cool. It was a pleasure to work with you, Dr. Nagar. Um, yeah, this um, oil painting, I predominantly work with photo and digital media, so this was a fun opportunity to work with physical um, physical media, I guess, and it expresses the multifaceted electric research that he does. So I can kind of explain it a little bit. Um, there's portions kind of alluding to mental and like the brain, um, and then trauma, and um, he does research or he's done research with um, bacteria and viral infection, as well as dehydration, and the outer framework of the pink circles kind of mimics an appendix because he's also studied how um, acupuncture can be an alternative to other numbing for um, appendicitis and surgery. So it's been really fun just to kind of work with him, see his environment, it's a completely different world that I'm used to, and just express his science in something that's a little bit more digestible than papers and research. Um, so yeah, it was a really fun project to be a part of. Thank you for having us. My name is Danny Wang. I'm a researcher, uh, I'm an imaging researcher uh, using a powerful magnetic resonance imaging scanner uh, at the 7 Tesla to image the brain. Uh, you know, as you can see, this is the uh, fine vasculature. Uh, and also on the background is the brain. So, um, you know, uh, in our institute, it's called the Stevens Neuroimaging and Informatics Institute. Uh, it's just around the corner uh, on the core. Uh, so we do a lot of graphics already uh, with digital technology. Uh, so I was a little bit driven by a little bit selfish reason, <laughs> try to promote our research. And uh, uh, I only talked to Grace once and uh, gave her some images. And uh, um, you know, I uh, when Ted sent the um, reminder email, then uh, I think maybe Grace forget about it. <laughs> then I emailed her again. You know, she showed me a peek of the uh, fine art. Uh, I was really impressed. Uh, yeah. So without further ado, I want to <laughs> introduce you to Grace. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, working with Danny has been great. Um, when he showed me a bunch of pictures all at the start, I. I had no idea what was going on. I was pretty much going, wow, that's a lot of detail and it looks really dense, really, you know, um, there's a lot of depth to these images, but you can't see because they're only, you know, two dimensional. So I thought it'd be really interesting to kind of bring that to life, bring that depth back. Um, and a lot of what your work has to do with is precision. So I thought, well, I normally work digitally. Let's make something more physical this time. So I got into laser cutting this year, been making a lot of like keychains and funny little things. Um, so it was really interesting to kind of bring something a bit more meaningful to life as well. And it's just been a pleasure. Thank you. I'm Eric Beal. Uh, my researcher, Dr. Chang, needed to uh, catch the train. So I'll be trying to describe his research and then my art piece. So uh, Dr. Chang's lab uh, is focused on gen population genetics. Their main mission is to try and understand what are the differences in genetics and mutations that cause different populations to arise across the globe. Uh, most of this is to, one, uh, show that there's a major connection between all people. Um, everyone is genetically related. Uh, one fact he shared was that there's I believe less than 1% of genetic variation between humans and in dog, two different dog breeds, there's more than maybe 50% of a genetic difference. Um, so we wanted to show that there's this major connection. His 
primary goal is to understand how genetics change in order to personalize medicine uh, at the end of the day. Um, so that's really his main research goal. In the art piece, um, I primarily drew to the one theory that he uh, told me about when we spoke to each other, which was the mitochondrial Eve story, um, the theory rather, that through this mitochondrial DNA, which is located in each one of our cells, you can trace the lineage of all people back and through this um, passing of genetic information from the mother to child, you can follow it back all the way to one individual about 200,000 years ago that we're all related to. So in this piece, I wanted to show various women working together on a genetic tree that is connecting all people together with different genetic differences um, branching off of it. I created this piece out of four panels because most of those genetic differences that do end up making people seem different from one another are caused by things like land borders or natural phenomenon. So any of the sort of spray marks and everything like that are part of the process to show that there's this natural change in evolution between people. Um, I also drive a Prius, so I needed to find a way to transport it here. Um, so the, the genetic tree really connects everybody and comes back to the source. Um, this is the hypothetical mitochondrial Eve that we're all related to. Uh, but I like how through the flow of this tree and through the flow of the pieces, it's almost as if there's time differentiating these different populations from one each other, one another. Um, and hopefully the tree will continue with uh, more pieces in the future. So thank you very much. Um, hi, my name is Carolyn Kalustian. I'm a, in the Department of Family Medicine, so I'm a family doc for over 10 years here at Keck. But I'm also a specialist in older adults called geriatrics. And those of you who know that field um, and that of gerontology, we often um, don't just deal with medicine, but also the psychosocial and other barriers that one may have, um, and, and also their environment and issues with their family. So when I see a patient, it's often not just medical problems, but what is everything that's going on? And so um, it was a pleasure to work with Gabe. Um, he won't be joining today, apparently, but he was able to bring um, this amazing work that he um, has created after hearing about my pro our project. So the PI of the project is actually Dr. Justine Decker. She is um, one of the phenomenal anesthesiologists in the Department of Anesthesiology here. And um, she reached out to me because it is protocol for those going into surgery that have, uh, are of older age to have sort of a cognitive assessment, so a memory test before, before going into anesthesia and surgery. And the reason for that is that the literature has shown over and over again that those with some impairment do worse later. And of course, having the amazing surgical center that we have, um, we want to decrease complications and post-op issues. And so we want a cognitive screen. Now in public health, we know we don't screen unless we have something to do about it. And so she would come to me and say, hey, Dr. K, so I'm screening, I'm doing my job, but we don't really know what to do now that if we have a positive test. So a really simple memory test and they fail it like a zero. What do we do? We do? And so our research is more of not like what we do, but how is the care gonna be done? And so it's a quality improvement project. And so we did implement a way to, with our project, implement um, uh, consistent screening um, with the MINICOG, which is a simple tool in the busy preoperative clinic. It's those of you who work in health delivery know that having people do something that they don't typically do routinely, accurately, uh, with the turnover that there is, um, and then um, having a process after that is quite challenging. So we were able to do that over the past three years, including during COVID. Um, there was obviously a gap during COVID because surgeries went down, but those that did happen, we were able to assist. And so we are continuously doing quality improvement on what we do once they screen positive and where my, I'm involved as they are if they score very poorly on this memory test, I do see them before surgery and optimize the situation. So, so there is now something that can be done and we, are, we have collected data, uh, mostly by chart review, to see how um, that is impacting outcomes and the care. And 
now focusing on why we're all here is this wonderful artwork. So Gabe is um, a specialist sort of in photography and sculpture. He was sort of debating on which one he was going to choose from. And I thought he'd go, I was to the last second, I thought he'd do sculpture because he had shown me overlapping hands, which I thought is incredible because the patients that did fail the memory test and came to me often is with their loved one holding hands and saying, I'm so glad you detected it. Our primary doc didn't listen to us that we were, and it's often that's the case, the health system in their 15 minutes barely knows that the patient is having cognitive impairment, but the family members know. They know it's happening, we have to listen. So this is an opportunity, and these family members are so thankful, and they come in with overlapping hands. And so those of you who are close enough can kind of see the overlapping hands underneath it all. And I think what was interesting, um, he overlapped it with sort of some breaking pieces here. And I think an interesting interpretation is um, I often am delusional and thinking we can do this. We can identify, we can put a team together, we can communicate and help. Um, but this is sort of putting your foot in those of us who have chronic illness or know of family members who do and navigate a really complex health system, whether that's making appointments, getting there on time, doing everything you need to do first, second, third, and then overlapping that with cognitive impairment and the stress of what's going on and no one really addressing it is, it's such a fragmented system. And so again, it's, it's just a great depiction of a quality improvement effort that will help um, those who are older who may not be getting the attention that they need in, in this wonderful system. Um, with the, the impairments they may have. Um, and not that they're not reversible, but it's important to know who they are at that moment so we can communicate the needs um, effectively. So thank you for this opportunity. <laughs> Hello, uh, I'm Gabe. Um, I had the pleasure of working with Dr. Kalustian for the past semester. Um, and her work was really inspiring is that it intended to and certain element of human care and a very tangible element of you know touch and being seen as a patient in an often very mechanical system of technology and large buildings and hallways and ways that it's difficult to be really heard and evaluated as a human. So I basically took photos of my friend's grandparents' hands and I took photos of this grid and I tried to cut them together and emulate a sort of interior architecture that's been folded inside out um, as a way of kind of laying it over this architecture of the medical system and then fighting for that sense of touch and connection and pushing and pulling and feeling, you know, skin and warmth within that system. So that's the piece. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ashley Chong. I'm a senior at USC Roski and I made this hanging sculpture of HPV and specifically the mucosa site where there's um, where the transmission of HPV happens. And upon meeting Dr. Cass and meeting his family and all of the research, extensive research, um, I realized I didn't really know very much about HPV. So this is kind of like a diagram because I really want it to be used as an opportunity, as like a tool for early education on HPV because after hearing all the extensive research, that's where I feel that eradication of HPV is really at the heart of getting the vaccination Gardasil into people at an earlier age because um, as you see, the progression gets worse. So it's like what, if untreated, the, the disease is pretty much a cancer at that point and it's um, fatal and it's just um, could be pretty much undetected for a very long time. So it's it's something that needs to happen earlier. So like I said, I really wanted this to be used as a tool, as a learning tool for early education. And I know that Dr. Cass's um, children are working in those veins where they educate um, lower income and early education kids. And I think that's really, really important for this cause. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> Thank you, Ashley. Um, I'm Hinda Cast. I'm actually representing my father, Dr. Martin Cast, who has been a cancer researcher in the field of HPV for over 30 years. Um, HPV is well known to cause several cancer, but it can also cause different types of cancer as well, like throat cancer. And it's also um, it can also cause um, different types of warts, and that also includes like the common hand and foot wart that you would see. However, if you have an immune deficiency, um, your body, as like if you were, if your immune system was working normally, your body would 
fight it off and get rid of it. Um, but if you have an immune deficiency, your body can't eradicate them and they just continue to grow um, on your body. And there's actually a situation for some men, um, primarily in Indonesia, in which the warts have grown um, all over their bodies to about a foot long. Um, my dad has actually interacted with about six of these men. Um, and I think that this piece that Ashley has done really beautifully sh depicts um, how destructive HPV can be to the body. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That was so great to hear all those stories. I'm just going to invite you to um, enjoy uh, the art and the, speak to the artists and researchers and help yourselves to food and drink and enjoy each other. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you.